So on today's video we've got the ADM31 dumb terminal. Now I'm doing a, a misjustice or, or you know <laughs> an incorrect term when I say dumb terminal because they like to call these intermediate terminals because they said they were an intelligent dumb terminal and I'll edit in about the documentation on this when it's uh, appropriate but you can see here <laughs> under all this dust there is a little label there that says it was an intermediate terminal, IT. Uh, you can see down here the ADM31, and it was made by a company called, and I can't pronounce this, Lear Siegler Inc. And this was a late 70s model. I think it was about 78, something like that. And uh, the same person that donated this to me was the person that donated the Pi Rambler TV. And they actually have similar tubes, uh, similar size tubes. And I just love the side profile of this. I just think this is so, so cool. Now, obviously it's covered in dust. It's disgusting. It wasn't particularly clean when I got it. Uh, but sadly, it's been sat in my uh, storage container or storage unit, um, which is next to a car spray booth. And all the dust from that spray booth seems to go into my unit. And uh, everything just gets covered in that dust, unfortunately. So that's one of the reasons for that. Uh, what we'll do is I'll just spin it round and we'll have a quick look at the back before we look at the insides. Okay, so on the back we've got a few different ports here. We have, um, I believe, is that printer? Is that the printer port? Yep, so we've got the printer port here. We have the modem port. And then we have the extension port. So we've got three ports here. We've got a standard three pin UK plug on it, which actually is kind of amusing compared to some of the other things I've done because it's actually a later plug with the safety um, shrouds on the pins, which is quite nice. And you can see we've got a pack test sticker here. I'm just looking to see, uh, is that eight for the first 83? So potentially that was the last time it was used. <laughs> so it's uh, it's not been tested in a little while. Um, we've got, like I say, the, the inlet for the power cable here. Nice rocker switch there. We've got a sticker down here, which is saying uh, power on that way, off that way. Uh, two, what does that say? 230 volts, 50, 60 hertz, five amps or 0.5 amps. I'm not close enough to tell. Uh, and about 80 watts there. And then what have we got here? Oh, a similar, yeah, it's saying similar things. Oh, 60 watts, is that? Saying 60 watts on that one. I'll just bring that into shot, sorry. Um, and yeah, we've got a serial number here. We've got the model, config number. And then on this side, we have the um, dip switches for setting for the printer and the modem. And then I think the monitor is a kind of brightness adjustment, I believe. And then we've got the, the actual fuse down in here in a little carriage, which I assume comes out somehow. And uh, yeah, that's pretty much all there is to see on the back. Now the actual design is a clamshell design. and uh, This is missing screws. Somebody has been playing with this over the years. So you just lift on the front and then it just pulls up like that and the back should just rest down. Now you may notice lots of loose things inside and we'll get to that in a moment. There we go. And let me move the camera so we've got a slightly better angle. Okay, so hopefully you can see the board here. Um, there's a couple of little bodge wires here so it looks like some repairs have been done. There are some maybe EEPROMs perhaps, something like that, and they've, they've had labels on them so I wonder if the software has been redone at some point, something like that. There's a, a loose cable here, which I think is for the monitor, and we'll I'll show you that uh, now. So I'm assuming that this terminal isn't actually functioning. And I'm saying that because we can see that the power board here, which should actually be screwed in somewhere underneath the, the display, it's actually loose. So it looks like somebody's been doing some testing on it, mucking about with it. And I'm certainly not going to plug it in with it like this. Um, I want to safely discharge the tube just in case there is any voltage held in it. And I would like to take it out of the case, have a look at this power board properly and um, 
see if we can get this working. Now, I do have the neck adapter for this tube for my CRT tester, and we will be testing it, and fingers crossed it's still a good tube. I'd like to actually see if I can get the two halves of the clamshell apart, because we're going to need to get it apart for cleaning. Now, obviously, like I say, this uh, ribbon cable here is disconnected, and it's, I believe it's, yeah, it's keyed. It's got a key in it. Um, so I'm not too worried about directional of that, but I don't suspect this side is as well keyed or, or what have you. So we'll just make a mental note that the cables go towards the back of the machine and um, we'll just pull that off and that's that removed. And actually there is a key within that and there's a missing pin. So that's nice. So it's directional. Um, when it comes to the actual clamshell, it, it looks like there's some sort of circlips, but I think they're rubber. Um, so if I try and, you know, you can see they're a bit mushy, and I'd like to try and get them off and save them if I can, but I don't know if that's going to be possible or not. Because um, they probably hardened somewhat over the years. Okay, there we go. And yeah, they look to be just um, very small little rubber washers um, or, or plasticky really. Um, so if I'm careful, they should be okay to go back on. Um, we'll see how we go. So I'll just try and do the other one. One looks like it may be a bit more stuck. Okay, sadly that one split, but we may be able to use some um, metal circlips or something. So I'll put these to one side, and um, we should be able to just rock this off the case. There we go. So we'll put the monitor side to one side, and then we'll just have another look at this half of the case and um, this board. Yes. Should be screwed down, it's not screwed down. Obviously, like I say, take note of the direction of the connectors. We'll remove that connector. And the board should just put out, yeah, there we go. So let's see what we've got underneath. Uh, so underneath we've got some board. Um, which could be original. It looks similar to other things I've seen before. And then we've got the actual power supply, uh, which you can see here. And we've got a fair few electrolytics on there, which uh, we'll replace in the general maintenance of the machine. Um, it's a nice little power supply. Doesn't look to be too much going on. So how many caps have we got? We've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. I think we've got 17, oh no, 18, looks like we've got 18 capacitors to replace on that, or to at least check, um, so there we go. So what we'll do is, um, we'll put this to one side and we'll have a look at the monitor side. So just before we um, look at how to discharge the CRT, we need to talk about safety. If you're not confident that you know what you're doing, and I'm very new to this, so I'm not hugely confident. Uh, you shouldn't do this because it can hold thousands of volts. It can kill. I can't be held responsible for that if you do something dumb. Uh, if I do something dumb, then that's on my on my head. But here we go. This is a high voltage uh, discharge probe, and it, it comes like this with a couple of attachments. You can see this one. I've got the the flat blade attachment, which is quite nice because you can just get it under the cup and tap it. You've got, um, I believe these are for connecting to a multimeter to see what the voltage actually is, which I haven't used yet. And then you've got the discharge clip. So um, we'll rig this up and, and do this now. So when it comes to discharging the tube, you want to connect the ground lead to something substantial. So we'll connect it to one of the uh, ears of the actual tube itself. And then, unfortunately, this anode cup is in a really awkward position. 
it's actually under the tube you can see here so I'm going to just try and reach this down see if I can yeah there we go okay and what I'm looking for is I'm looking to hear metal on metal which I think what I might do is I might see if I've got a plastic tool to lift that cup up a little bit. So I've actually got a um, CRT potentiometer tool here. Um, I'm just going to see if I can just get that under the cup or not. There we go. Okay. So we'll just see if we can use that. I can see metal now actually, which is good. So hopefully I can get this in here. Okay, so sorry that the angle was bad, but I've managed to get that in there, and touching the metal, so it's discharged. So hopefully I'll be able to um, safely disassemble this tube now. So what we'll do is we'll have a go at removing this neck board, and you just want to wiggle it very gently, there we go, that's that part of it done. And then we need to, let me just move it over a second, we need to remove the ground cable there and uh, then unplug the yoke and then obviously lastly the anode cup. So I'll try and do the ground wire now and I'll be back with you in a second. So I've just changed the angle of the tube here. Um, I removed the neck board, as you saw a moment ago. And what I've done is I've just removed the clamps that hold the tube into the case. And they are just a uh, eight mil hex. Um, just using a standard little driver here. I did hope to get the um, ground lead off, but I didn't have the strength to do it with that particular tool. So I'm hoping by moving those, yeah, that's made the tube loose. Um, it actually just sort of sits in a recess at the back, so it should just be those front two bolts and then yeah, the whole tube will lift out. So I'm just going to carefully, because I don't really want to scratch the tube at all, just carefully lift that out and um, we'll just move that casing out of the way if I can, move over there. And, um, We'll just, just pop this tube down here for a second and then I'll get something for that to sit on and we'll have a look at it. So this is the tube, it's just sat on a dried out wet wipe and a little jiffy bag. You can see it's a small little tube, a um, little 12 inch tube I believe. And um, what we need to do is we need to try and get that uh, ground removed. See if I can do it any better when it's out. Yeah, okay, that's better. Oh, that's nice, it's not a complete ring terminal, it's um, a U, little sort of spade there. So, that's nice. We'll just have a look. So there we go, so we've got better access to the anode cup now. And what I might do is I might just have another go at um, discharging that before I pull that out. Um, as I said, we need to disconnect the yoke. It looks like, um, just move those wires out of the way. It looks like we've got a couple of connectors on it, on the board itself. And uh, they look to be quick release, I believe. So we've got the grey and the brown, and we've got the green and the white there. So we'll have a go at the green and the white, there we go, and the grey and the brown. Yeah, there we go. So it's just the anode cup to unplug. Like I say, I'll just uh, bring the dis discharge uh, tool in once more. So I can give you a better angle of what I was doing. So what I was trying to do is um, connect the ground to the casing like that and then get the actual tool and you, you don't want to use 
two hands of course you want to just use one and get it under the cup and get it to touch the metal now I'm just going to steady it yeah there we go and I'm definitely touching it and there's definitely no spark so what I should be able to do is I should be able to now remove the anode cup from the tube so what we'll do is we'll just put this under there and see if I can see where the um, where the actual prongs are um, and what I might do is I might just do this off camera because it's a bit tricky but if you look at the state of my fingers you can see the, um, the soot that's on this so this will need lots of cleaning so I've successfully removed the anode cup and checked it's discharged and when you remove it you always want to just touch the prongs to the um, casing as well just to make sure it is 100% discharged and we can see that there there probably was some sort of grease under this at some time uh, but it's very powdery now um, and non-existent so that's dried out so that will need new dielectric uh, grease and we will clean the tube of course and when you're finished as well also get the discharge tool and just um, pop it in there just to make sure there's no residual current residual voltage uh, so we now have the chassis out so we can have a little look at this and we can see there's a good couple of capacitors on here as well um, and obviously everything is much bigger due to the age um, like the I believe they're probably yeah they're interesting that they call them R when they're diodes but you can see the diodes are absolutely huge uh, got some capacitors here and uh, yeah, generally fit, uh, the resistors in the middle, uh, generally on a bigger scale compared to more modern stuff. So what we'll uh, what we'll do is we'll be removing all the electrolytics off of this, cleaning it, and seeing how we go from there. So in order to test this CRT, I want to actually put it back in its casing, um, but it is absolutely disgusting. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to use a cheap paintbrush and some wet wipes and just dust down this casing, give it a clean and then refit the tube. So I'll do that now. So that's just the first pass on the uh, CRT there and it looks a lot cleaner than it was and it's got a nice sort of dull sheen to it so I imagine it's got some sort of anti-reflective properties in it which is quite nice. So I'm going to pop that uh, back in the case now and then we'll move on to testing. Okay so the CRT tube is back in the case behind me. This is the CRT tester which I've shown in other videos which I'll link to below and what I was waiting for was the neckboard adapter for this particular type of tube. So I had to order this in from America, um, which I think it was something like 20, 30 pounds, something like that. But then the guy wanted um, 60 to 70 pounds to post it to the UK, which was ridiculous. So luckily a friend of mine um, who lives in America was actually able to pop this in with some other bits that were being posted uh, to a company I work with. And um, obviously you can see that the size of the cable, it, it weighs nothing. So it didn't affect the postage of that item. And um, yeah, I got the postage for free. So that was nice. So I've just had to pay for the cable, but I had to wait for it to uh, come through. So I'm hoping that this is the correct adapter for this tube, which is the um, adapter number seven, CR7. 
So we'll have a little look here, see what we can work out. Sorry, I just realized you didn't see that. So um, yeah, the key is um, there. So you can see you've kind of got like a horseshoe of pins. And looking at this, it looks like the, the break in the horseshoe is at the bottom. So it actually needs, needs to go on in that sort of direction like that. So I'm just gonna try and fit that off camera so that uh, I can ensure I'm doing it right. So I've managed to get it rigged up now. Um, it's a bit awkward to get the wire in there. You can just about probably see that. So what I'll do is I'll um, see, let's see. What I'll probably do is now you can see that, I'll uh, bring the camera in so we're looking at the actual tester itself. Okay, so looking at the tester, the tester's unplugged at the moment. And um, what we need to do is make sure all of the dials are to zero. Um, that is in the power off position. Zero, zero, zero. Now my gun selector, I've got um, red, green, blue, but red is black and white. So I just need to set that to black and white. And now I can plug it in. It's in power off mode, set heater range. And I think, yeah, we get power light, okay. So what I need to do, I just need to go and double check the settings of this tube and I'll bring it up on screen in a second in editing. So I just wanted to check the spec of the tube there. So um, I've shown this website in a, another video, the CRT tester video. Um, so there's more information about it there. But basically I'll, um, I'll pop in the tube type, which is 12ZBY31. Uh, and it is 31N, but it doesn't have that. So we'll go for the 31. And if we have a look here, it says, yep, it's 12 inch face. Um, this surprised me at first, but there we go. Saying the filament voltage is 12.6. And sadly, it doesn't show the setup for the B&K tester, but I know that the neck adapter is adapt to seven. Um, and I would add this if I knew how to uh, edit this for them. Now, the interesting thing is, is, um, yeah, here we go. I found this document, um, which chats about another terminal, I think, and it shows the three different Samsung screens you could get. You can get the 12ZBY31, which is what I've got, which is a green phosphor, BY4, which is a white phosphor, and amber, which is an amber <laughs> phosphor. Um, so the interesting thing is, is this, site shows the same screens and you can see here the filament voltages and you've got 12.6 6.3 for the white and uh, 12 for the amber so it's interesting that you need a different filament voltage for the different phosphor screens i found that a bit strange but there we go so back to the screen in question we need 12.6 on the heater voltage and we'll flip back to the video now. So we have the uh, tester, as we know. Now, mine is a little bit out of calibration. And I would always probably advise if you have the capability to do this, do this to test. Um, as I say, always keep your gauges down to uh, zero. Now, I've made up a quick test cable, um, which you can see here. And what I've done is I've just... Um, Purchased from Mauser one of the Molex connectors and the pins, um, which again are mentioned in my other video. And I've added two cables, the colours don't matter because it's AC. And we've got the two cables for AC um, filament voltage. Now I'm going to just connect that in, and it is keyed so you can't get it wrong. And then I'm going to put the multimeter on these pins. And we'll get it to the 12.6 volts that I need, and we'll see... On the gauge that it's ever so slightly out so i'll um just reposition the camera so you can see that so here we have the test lead connected to the clip leads of the multimeter um, so that's so that i can dial this in perfectly and i'll show you what it shows on the meter it's ever so slightly out so step one is on the tester we need to go to normally 12 to 14 but i'm going to go to 10 to 12 because my tester's a little bit out i'm going to turn that on that uh, starts at 10.49, hopefully you can see that. So I'm going to bring the gauge up and we're looking for 12.6, a bit higher there. So that, there you go, so that's 12.6, give or take. 
And um, what we'll do is I'll just move the camera and just bring it up over the gauge so that you can see the difference. So that's what's showing on the gauge there. And um, you can see it's slightly out. It's quite a bit under. And if I actually brought the gauge up to the 12.6 line, which I think is roughly there, it's hard to see because I'm not directly over it. We can see that it's coming in at 13.2. So it's it's quite a bit out in the higher range, which is what I'm worried about. So I'll put that back down to 12.6 and then we can move on to the next bit. So as we know, we've got the heater range actually set, but we'll, we'll go to set. And did you see a slight glow in the neck there? So there was a glow in the neck, which is good. And we know that we're on our 12.6. So we'll go to the next test, which is the uh, leakage test. And we're looking to check for leakage. And on the heater, it's saying we have no leakage. And on the G1, it's saying we have no leakage, which is good. So we now need to set the G1 voltage. So again, make sure all of your dials are as far back as they go. And just reminding myself how to do this. All right, so we'll go to set heater. We've seen a little bit of a glue there. So the heater's back on. Check our shorts. We're at the bottom end of the band for OK, which is fine. Shorts again, bottom end of the band, we're OK. So set the G1 voltage. Now I had to have a little look online about this. And um, I've had to guess it. And I think that it's 30 volts. Um, and we've got our G1 scale at the bottom here. So I'm going to come up to 30 volts. is there and then we need to set our G2 cutoff is the next one and we've only got one gun here which is the black and white gun and it says it needs to be one division so it's on zero at the moment so we need to come up ever so slowly we want that gauge to come up one division, there it is, just check, that's just under, oh that's just over now, I would say that's one division, so now we can read our emissions, <laughs> and it's saying this is a bad tube, okay, interesting, um, Yeah, okay. So this puts me in a tricky spot because is it reading bad because I've got my G1 voltage wrong? Or is it reading bad because it is bad? So I'm just going to go through things again. So I'm going to go to the set heater and we should see it glow. Yeah, I think you just saw that. We know that's at the correct voltage. We know we have no heater leakage, we have no G1 leakage. Set G1 voltage. Now I've had to make this up, and I think it should be 30 volts, and I don't know obviously how accurate that is. Um, so I'm just going to set it just over 30 volts, but I think that should be correct. Set our G2 cutoff, it should be at one division, which it is. We go to read emissions. It's confidently in the bad. Um, now if we push the button at this point, we'll get the um, sort of life of the tube, depending on drop off. So I'm going to press it. And it drops off relatively slowly. Which is fine. That's what we expect or want. And we're looking to see what happens with the rise up. It's rising quite slowly as well. So... Not sure about that. So we know it doesn't have shorts, so I'm not going to bother to do a remove short. I think I'm going to try a clean and balance. I've never done this before, so it could just kill it instantly. I don't know, but we'll see.
That's an interesting noise. Okay, so we can see that the filament is uh, warming up and this tester is making a very interesting buzzing noise. So I'm not too sure about it to be honest. The idea is to push the button and do a and sort of jolt it, but we'll see I suppose. Let's try it. So it's flied up or flown up, sorry. We're waiting for it to drop and let go. So that's the clean and balance. So let's go back to read emissions. And it has gone up. <laughs> it's actually gone up. It's gone up to the sort of middle setting. Um, so let's check our G1 voltages. Just over 30. Now our G2 cutoff is it's gone down. So let's um, let's bring that up to one division. And let's read emissions now. And amazingly, would you look at that? It's just gone into good. It's amazing. <laughs> and let's do a, a life test. Yeah, it drops slower. Do a recover. It's just creeping into the good. So potentially I'll do another clean and balance. And I can see some filament glow. It says to wait 10, 20 seconds, so I'll do that. So I've waited 20 seconds and I'm gonna try it again. So it's gone all the way up, it's gone off the chart. And it's dropped, it's dropped, it's dropped, and we'll let go. And we'll go back to read emissions. Mm, that's sad, it's got worse. Um, we'll check our relevant voltages. We're at one division. Yeah, it's gone back down to um, Yellow, sadly. Okay, so I was quite busy yesterday, so I decided to power on and, and sort some stuff out. But I've uh, checked over the neck board, and that all looks okay. All the resistors are testing within spec to the service manual. So what I've done is just reflowed the solder joints on the back, cleaned that up. And I've desoldered all of the capacitors from the actual uh, CRT power supply board. And... They look to have all leaked marginally, uh, but they mostly look to be in spec, but we'll get to that when we get to that. So whilst I'm sense checking through things, I've checked the diodes, all of the diodes look good. So I was looking at this um, device in the middle, which had a little heat sink on it, which I've just removed. And there's some thermal paste on the heat sink, but you can see that it's just dust basically you can see it's all come off on my map so the the thermal paste is definitely uh, overdue a replacement but I, I actually think this part could be I don't know if that's dried yeah it's, yeah, it's flaking uh, this is part I believe Q404 which is a transistor BU407 now I think it's shorted um let's see if I can get that there for you. So I've got my multimeter in diode mode. And if I go um now let me see if I can see. I think it's I think it's base collector emitter um at a glance. So if I go base to collector in one direction, out of limits, which is correct, then in the other direction I'm getting a voltage drop of 445 which looks fine and then if I do um, emitter to collector um, 444 four, and then the other direction is out of limits which is good but then if I do um, base to emitter I think it was shorting Got my leads all twisted up, so let me just undo that.
Yeah, that's coming back 0.001, which to me is direct short. And then the other way, 0.002. And then if we go over to Ohms, I suppose, again, we should see. Yeah, it's coming in at 1.7 ohms. And you would imagine the same, 1.7 ohms. So I think that's um I think that's shorted. So I'm gonna desolder it and um see what it tests like out of circuit. And that could be uh one of the reasons that this board was loose. Obviously somebody was testing it and trying to work out what was wrong with it. Um one of the capacitors has actually uh flagged as being out of spec. Um but I suspect that was probably the the bigger issue. So get that desoldered and see what we find. So I've been through this board now. As I say, I've reflued the neck board. I've cleaned the high voltage wire, so it's nice and clean now. I've uh, used a anti-back wipe on the anode cup and then gone over it with alcohol. And you can see there that that's, that, that's uh, nice and clean now. So that's all ready to go back on. The rubber still feels... Um, relatively flexible so i'm happy with that i think that's all okay there's no fraying or anything like that so that looks good um the actual board itself that component there when i tested it out of circuit it tested good and i found out in the end that see this resistor uh, here when you look at it on the other side what it's doing is it's connecting uh, i believe this is what they call an inductor it's connecting the inductor to both sides of it, so it reads like it's a direct short. And I was reading, uh, sorry, I was watching videos earlier about this, and if I had a standalone ESR meter, I think I would be able to prove that it isn't shorting uh, if I put a high-frequency thing through it, because that won't relate to it. But basically, it's the inductor that's, uh, that's causing that f sort of false positive on the short. So that part tested perfectly fine out of circuit. So I've put some fresh thermal paste in there, screwed it back down, put the heat sink back on, so that's fine. Um, like I said, I took that resistor out just to check that, that's fine. The potentiometers on the board, I suspect, probably haven't moved in quite some time. So I've used uh, deoxit, let me just get that can out. Used um, some deoxit fader lubricant there, and I like to use that on um, all potentiometers where possible. So I squirted a bit in and I've uh, spanned them around and then moved them to approximately where they were. So hopefully if it does power up at all, um, it should still do something and then I could tweak them if need be. Um, yeah, I'm quite impressed. I think generally the board looks fine. I've checked all the diodes. The diodes are testing perfectly fine. So I think I'm done with that until I can get the replacement uh, capacitors. So the next thing is the actual power supply for the computer. And this is uh, what that looks like. Now you can see here you've got an inspection, quality assurance, quality assessment, whatever. Inspection, 19, well, 83. Just on the bottom there. So, yeah, it looks like I guess it was made and produced around 83 and used around 83 and then maybe not used again but then technology was moving so fast back then uh, perhaps it wasn't in, in service long so obviously there's lots of capacitors on this board what have we got we've got uh, one two three four five, 17 I think maybe 17 electrolytics and it looks like we've got a little tantalum just there so I will check that and see if I can get a picture of what that is before we plug it in because apparently tantalums can just blow uh, really quite aggressively. So I may see if I can find out what that is and get some spares on hand. Um, but yeah, the rest of the caps look to be film caps. At this stage, I'm not seeing any leaking, but I suspect there is leaking. We'll um, just go over the connector pins, just polish them up a little bit. And I would like to test this. I need to look into what this is exactly. I imagine it's some sort of voltage regulator, something along those lines. Um, so I would like to test that, see if that's still available. And um, 
yeah, I think it would then be the case of, there's, well, actually, there's a couple of diodes I can check, but then it would be a case of trying to power this up and actually see if the computer works, I would suspect. I don't know if I can test this power supply with no load. Uh, that is a, a question I have at this stage, but there we go. So I'm going to have a go at desoldering this and um, see how we go. Just looking here, it looks like there's been potentially some re rework on that, whatever that is. Uh, what is that? Is that a resistor? And that is... Yeah, it looks like potentially that, that resistor might have been replaced at some point. I don't know why. Um, you can see there's a little bit of flux residue there. But other than that, the board looks to be completely original. And that actually looks to be in really good condition. It doesn't look like it's got hot. So I wonder if this maybe hasn't seen much use. I mean, obviously it's very dirty, but I'm partly to blame for that. Um, although the CRT is quite dead, so don't know on that, don't know. With the desoldering of the capacitors out of the way, uh, what I like to do is I like to spreadsheet up the results. Um, this allows me to go ahead and order the new capacitors, work all of that out. It just makes it easier for me. So I have this sort of template I came up with here. Anything that's in blue is relevant to the actual physical capacitors. Uh, anything that's not is kind of like the static values. So down the left hand side we've got the component numbers of what it is on the board. Then we've got the uh, values which I've taken off of the side of the capacitors. So you don't necessarily always need a service manual as long as nobody's fiddled with it. You could um, look at the capacitors that are already there for most of the information. Then like I say we have the values and then on the very end there we have some Mauser links and that's what I've ordered as a replacement. Now I'm not going to cover uh, everything here in depth because I've covered it many times in other videos so I'll show you that in a bit but anyway um, I think it's going to be just off screen here but this is the CRT driver board this tab is the power supply board and you can see there's a lot more capacitors on that in the end um, I've got a little formula here which you can see at the top of the screen and that's saying if the value is in or out of tolerance you can see most of the one microfarads are all out of tolerance, but some of the larger ones, this 22 here, actually came in at 27, so it's slightly out of tolerance there. But, you know, I think it would have probably been okay, but they were leaking and uh, slightly out of tolerance. Now, the interesting thing is the things like the VLOS here. You can see that's quite high. Um, and then if there's any high ESRs like that one, but that one was flagged as failed. So I like to um, order from Mauser, and what I've done is I've created some projects for this. And that just means if for some weird reason I needed to order this again, I could just go um, order this project, uh, the order button there. So this just shows the replacements that I got for the... CRT board and that will show the replacements that I got for the power supply. Now you can already see some of these um, uh, on back order, they've already gone out of stock. So if you were to do this project, you would have to try and find something of equal value. But you can see it's not too expensive. It was 16 pounds there. And uh, what was that one? That was four pounds there so 20 odd pounds in capacitors so it's not bad all things considered um, if you want to see more in depth of how I've done this it is actually on my VX7000 video on how to build a cap kit and that is based on information from RetroTech Steve if you just go over to his channel look for capacitors how to create a capacitor kit that sort of stuff and uh, between the two links that will show you everything you need to know Whilst waiting for the uh, capacitors to turn up from Mauser, I thought it would be important to actually attempt to clean the board and the keyboard. So all of the keys were removed by hand um, and put in soapy water for a couple of hours and then cleaned and polished up, dried off. 
you can see here this is all the plungers without the keys and there's a lot of gunk under the keyboard the board was um, quite covered in dust so I used an ESR brush went outside dusted it off used some alcohol uh, this was then reassembling the keyboard now you can see all the keys have cleaned up boards looking a lot nicer um, that took a couple of hours uh, and that's the keyboard reassembled there and you can see the board is actually a bit more green now rather than dusty so that was the keyboard cleaning okay so this is the um, time lapse now or fast forwarded capture um, this is all the capacitors have come from Mauser so this is me I'm bagging them uh, eyeing them up working out which ones are which um, I get the little tester out there you can see and just see uh, what they look like compared to the old capacitors I don't remember if I did that for all of them now um, so here you can see me test fitting the capacitors and what I'm doing is I'm bending the legs uh, over the pads you may notice this is an old-fashioned design and it was traditional to bend the legs over and have longer pads um, which I don't think is a bad thing it's just not done so much now so I thought I'd go with it um, mimic how it was originally uh, built. I think in hindsight I shouldn't have used the uh, fine tip. I think the pads were far too big for this so I should have used a chisel tip or something like that but you know I got the job done. So you can see me uh, running through all the capacitors now making sure they are what I think they are and getting them all in the board. I've used the standard processes I've shown in the past I'm using the no clean flux and the leaded solder as I like to use and I'll put a bit of music on here and let you watch this but I think all told this was about uh, an hour and 20 minutes of video which I've sped up quite considerably so um, have a little watch and I'll be back with you soon.
So we're coming up to the end of this section of the video and this is just me quickly cleaning up the uh, insulator and the actual component, which I think is a transistor or a MOSFET of some sort. It seems to be a Motorola SJ7608. And um, I'm going to talk about this a bit more in a second and I did find some interesting web links that I'll put in the description. So I've been probing about a little bit here. I don't have the right microphone plugged in, sorry. Um, but just quickly, it, it says there's a short direct across the pads, but or continuity rather. Um, and if you do a resistance reading when it wakes up, 15.6 ohms. What is that? Yeah, 15.5 ohms. Um, but you've got a resistor here or something here, look. which gives a reading of that. And then you've got another resistor here, which is given that 15.2 ohms, 15.1. So 15.4, see? So I wonder if that's actually to be expected because when you go to diode mode and test the component that is in there, you're getting your voltage drop perfectly fine. So nothing that way. Come on. It's not on diode mode, is it? So put 547, which is your voltage drop, and then you'll get nothing. So that part appears to be good. And I think that the the sort of short you're getting is because of the way the circuit's designed. So I think that's fine. So the board has been recapped. I've uh, reflowed joints that looked a bit iffy or I reflowed the connector for reliability. So, you know, maybe the power supply is good. Just have to plug it in and test. What I don't know is I don't know if you can um, run the power supply without a load. So I'm just cleaning up the uh, heat sink there now and reapplying some new thermal paste. You might notice this is a sort of white thermal paste, a more cheap basic one. Um, that's actually because in this context we don't want a thermal paste that's electrically conductive. So anything with silver in it, something like that. Could be dangerous, could be conductive, so we just use the standard. I think it's uh, silicon, but I'll put a link in the description. So you just put the um, sort of cheap and cheerful thermal paste on for this. So I'm just reassembling it. And when you put the nuts and the bolts in, you just want to make sure that you just do them sort of snug, but you do not want to over tighten them because otherwise you can damage the isolator and what have you, or the insulator, however you want to skin it. Um, so yeah. That's me just testing that, making sure that it's uh, not shorted and it's still okay, soldering it back in, and then we'll get towards the end of this video. So I have the um, power supply back in here now, and I've put the board back in, I've dusted over it a little bit, um, plugged and unplugged the connector a few times, I've cleaned all the keyboards, the keyboard's nice and clean. I'm not going to bother to connect the CRT up to it just yet. I just want to plug it in and see if it goes bang. I don't, I don't know. So it's currently off. There's a toggle switch on the back. It's in the off position. I'll um I'll plug it into the wall. We'll see if anything happens. So that's it plugged in. Let's trip the switch. See what happens. Huh. Okay, it beeped, and the caps lock lights come on. Well, that's somewhat interesting. <laughs> hmm. It beeps off. It beeps on. Okay, well, one would imagine that maybe it's uh, showing some signs of life then. 
So the step next I would suggest would be to try and get my multimeter in the prongs. I'll have to look at what the pinout of this is and see if we're getting all the right voltages. So um, let me see if I can work that out and uh, go from there. So we're back. So um, I've done some testing on the main board, as I say, and it, it turns on and get a little beep and we get the um, caps lock, caps lock uh, glow red. I have recapped the power supply. I believe the power supply to be good based on that fact. I've put the multimeter through the pins on here. We seem to be getting all the voltage rails, which looks good. Put the uh, multimeter across there, getting some uh, some good readings, which looks good. I have um, connected the horizontal drive uh, to the oscilloscope, and, and I should have shown that in the video by now. So the waveform for that looks good. We know the CRT tests bad. The CRT driving board, I'm hoping the recap is successful, but at the moment, of course, it's untested. So I could plug this in and this could go catastrophically bang. Um, I really don't know. I could plug it in and it could just work. I think the computer is working or, or the terminal is working. What I don't know is if the high voltage is going to work and if this is going to go wrong. The the board here, this should sit here somehow, but there is no online manual for the AMD31. I have since found out that, that whilst the case looks like the ADM3, and whilst the power supply is newer, the CRT is actually the same one in the ADM5, and I've found a YouTube video of somebody recently doing a restore on an ADM5, and you can just about make out where the board sits. So I've messaged that person, and I'm hoping that I might get a reply on that. So we'll see on that. I just wanted to jump in quickly at this part of the video. Um, actually, the, the chap that I messaged was very, very helpful. He replied almost instantaneously. Um, this is the video I was talking about. As you can see, I've subscribed to his channel. Um, you can see my comment here. Look, um, you know, love to hear from you and literally straight back. And, you know, as I say here, this is what YouTube should all be about. Helping people out, sharing information, learning together. And it's a big thing about, you know, big part of what I'm about. So, um, Good video, I'll just mute it, but you can just see he's just um, plowing through an ADM5 here. And it's very similar to the ADM31, but the brightness control is on the front, and I think the keyboard layout is marginally different, but very similar clamshell design. Um, so he was able to send over some photos uh, for me of the bracket. And I'll just bring that up for you now, so we can see here, from the top down view, uh, this is really quite interesting, it's quite telling. It's, it's nice to see that you can see the flyback cable should go into a cable tie sort of thing over there. And you can see that the uh, the board, it, it sort of slides into these grooves. And then there's this metal bracket with two bolts. And they go, they sort of hold the board flat. And from a slightly different angle you can see, I think, yeah, that one. It just goes over a hole, and I think the other side is the same. Yeah, it looks to sort of click into a hole, perhaps. Um, I'll have to have another look at my board to check, to be honest with you. But essentially, um, that's, and you can see I have that uh, cable restraint there, still on my machine, um, and that one there. So you can see the layout of how that would sit now, which is uh, nice to see. And um, yeah, that's the part I'm missing. So I think I'll end up making one. It doesn't look to be too complicated. I'll have to take some hand measurements of the case and get a bit of sheet still and have a go at that. Obviously, how you would make it is you would make it perfectly flat. And then potentially you would pop this in a, um, 
you can get like a sheet steel brake and it's also got like a, a bender on it so I could I know somebody that has one to bend that um, that long straight in for rigidity and again with those you could clamp that in for that so I'll, uh, I'll take some measurements and see if I can get get that knocked up to get that board safely back in where it should be so what I'm going to do I'm going to turn the main light off now um, I'm going to wander over to the other side of the room see if I can find where the plug is now I've already turned the switch on the back of the machine so when I plug this in it's literally going to try and power up so what I'm hoping is uh, let me just check the camera yeah what I'm hoping is is we might see some um, neck glow or if we see any sparks or, or whatever I don't know but <clears throat> we'll uh, we'll see how this goes um, I'm really dreading this but here we go three two one It beeped, but the CRT didn't do anything. What did it? Oh, there is the slightest neck glow. Hmm. I don't know if the camera's picking that up. Well, it might be. Let me let me move you. I think so. I think you can probably just make out the uh, the glow on the neck there. But sadly, nothing. Um, but I didn't hear high voltage. So, hmm, <laughs> there's obviously a bigger problem. That's a shame. Okay, I will, um, I will just unplug it. Oh, now that's interesting. <laughs> when I unplugged that, I got a flash across the screen. Let me plug that back in. Oh, yeah, that doesn't sound too spectacular. Let's unplug that. Hmm, that's high voltage. So, <clears throat> hmm, it's waking up, or something's changed because. I then got a quite a bright line across the screen that time. Um, I might just try it once more, but I don't really want to keep trying this. Um. That really doesn't sound ideal. I had a line on power up, but I didn't have a line on power off. Hmm. Okay. So this is potentially very dangerous now, so I'm not going to touch this. It's unplugged. I'll leave it overnight. Um, yeah, progress of sorts, <laughs> we'll see how we go. So I just have to jump out of the video quickly again here to uh, mention the RMC cave. The cave is something that's relatively local to where I live, it's about half an hour's drive away and um, I noticed that there was an open day coming up. Uh, which was a couple of weeks ago. Uh, myself and my partner went up and uh, went to the cave, met Neil, uh, met the rest of the team. I, you know, I, I don't want to get into it now, but incredible place, really love what they're trying to achieve. Uh, and I think it's something they should be very proud of. Um, but the reason I have to bring this up is that I thought, do you know what? I don't know what I'm doing with this terminal at this stage, so I'm going to take it with me in the car and just see if there's anybody there um, that could help. Now, thankfully, they had uh, Rob on hand that day, and I walked in to see Rob with a couple of CRTs uh, in pieces and asked if we could have a quick chat, and I explained the situation, brought the terminal up. Stupid me, I took the terminal without the cable that connects the CRT to the board, so we couldn't plug it in. Um, but he gave me some general advice and said he would be happy to uh, look at the footage and see if he could... 
uh, it vies from from where he lives. And um, just want to give a shout out to the cave to Rob at Resurrection Retro. This is his channel. You can see my message there. Absolute pleasure to meet him. Um, really enjoyable. We had a good laugh. Um, I was saying about all of the CRTs that I own, and I think he was absolutely made up with that. <laughs> so, um, Rob, hopefully you'll you'll see this section of the video and understand how much I appreciate your time. And hopefully, um, with the footage that I'll add in a second, uh, hopefully we can diagnose what I'm missing and get this terminal working. So, back to the video. On the screen now is the uh, J1 and the J2 pinouts. J1 is the power input uh, connector to the main board. And you can see here that we seem to have a 12 volt rail. Not too sure what this is about. 20 volt rail, perhaps minus 12, five volts. I'm not sure what the 0.6 is about and 16. It looks like this rail should be about 15 volts. I think we should have a 12 volt and a negative 12 volt and a 5 volt. Not too sure, like I say, what pins 4 and 1 is about because I don't have the proper manual for this terminal. Um, but it looks like they're somewhat in spec. The, the concerning one for me is the 15 volts. It looks a little bit high, um, so I don't know if anybody's got any faults on that, but at least it's there. Uh, J2 is the connector for the CRT drive. And you can see here that we've got a couple of grounds. We've got horizontal drive, vertical drive, uh, video, and the 15 volts, which I believe is what powers the CRT in some capacity, uh, whether that's for the heater or, or what have you. Um, and you can see here I've taken a screenshot of the edge connector from the Samsung manual, just to give you an idea of what that looks like. And I've also taken a screenshot of a page in the ADM5 terminal manual, which actually shares the exact same CRT as the AM, uh, ADM31. And you can see here that the colors match and uh, the pins seem to match. So I sounded out the cable and proved that all of these pins seem to be connected. So generally, I think the cable is fine. Uh, generally, I think that the voltages aren't too bad. And then what we'll come on to next is uh, with the oscilloscope, what we see on the video, what we see on the uh, vertical drive and the horizontal drive. Before I show my actual results of what I'm seeing with the oscilloscope, I just want to show you what's in the Samsung manual. Now, unfortunately, this shows within a 60 hertz region and I'm in the UK in a 50 hertz region. So my results are going to be slightly different and I'm not clued up enough to know um, what the differences would actually be. But the way I'm looking at it is we've got horizontal drive here and you've got a sort of square wave that then repeats itself after so long. And then we've got a vertical drive, which again, you get the sort of square wave drop. Um, and the, the guide has two pages, one at 19,200 hertz, one at 16,200 hertz but both are at the 60 hertz uh, refresh rate of the power, I suppose. Um, and they seem to show marginally different values, I think. Yes, you've got, what's that, 18, 18 to 24 microseconds, 22 to 30. Um, but yeah, that shows you at least that you should be looking for this kind of uh, pattern, I suppose. As I'm sure I've said before, I don't really know how to use an oscilloscope properly. Sadly, I've got no formal electronics training. Uh, the only thing I've ever done formal was um, before GCSEs, so year seven, eight and nine uh, electronics at school. And sadly, we didn't get to play with the more technical stuff. It was just very basic how to solder and um, what a resistor was, what a capacitor was, that sort of thing. So I don't really know what I'm looking for here but on the screen now is the horizontal drive and you can see it's got some peak to peak voltages apparently it's got some sort of frequency um, and it's got a period now whether that means anything to anybody I don't know but there we go similarly on the screen now is the vertical drive 
There's some information probably missing from this, but you can see that there is that sort of square wave nice cut off. So I assume the vertical drive is functioning correctly, but that is a horrible assumption. Lastly, we've got the video activity and this is all over the place doing stuff. Now I can only assume that that's to be expected. You know, at least it's not completely dead. Uh, but again, I don't actually know what I'm looking for. Okay, so it's been a couple of weeks. I haven't had a chance to get back to this. So I'm just having another look at it. I've just um, taken a load of uh, screenshots on my oscilloscope of the video, vertical drive, horizontal drive. I've checked all the grounds are present, checked the voltage is present. I'm seeing activity, I'm seeing stuff. So perhaps the board or the, the PCB is good, the computer, the terminal. And I just want to record the end of the video, which is basically what happens with the CRT. Now, again, it's unplugged at the moment. I've got the switch turned on on the terminal itself. So I'm just going to plug it in and we'll see what we get. Hopefully it doesn't explode. Um, we will see. There's that horrible noise again. I'm getting static on the tube. So that must be high voltage. Did you see a slight flash? It's bright in the room, so maybe you didn't, but there was a slight flicker of light. Try again. Still a bit of static, so I don't know if that's now trying to display a picture. It could just be on um, really dim brightness, but that noise that's now not there. Nothing this time. No flash, nothing. Try again. Oh. Anybody see the little flash go up the screen? Okay, I'm going to leave it there because I don't know what I'm doing. So, fingers crossed somebody can tell me what I'm missing. Thanks for viewing and please give me comments. Let me know what you think.